I'm actually your MC for today. So our first speaker today will be Timothy Tan, who will be sharing more about um, Security Express VPN. He will use phishing campaigns to dive into how deep, how different departments in Express VPN connect with one another and function together, and how the role of security engineering fit into the whole picture. Timothy is part of the RAID team at Express VPN. He works mainly on conducting security assessments and RAID team engagements. He graduated from SMU School of Information Systems back in 2019 and started his career at PricewaterhouseCoopers as a cybersecurity consultant initially before landing his role at Express VPN earlier this year. Without further ado, let's welcome him. All right. Uh... Hi, everyone. Uh, very good evening. Uh, I'd just like to start by saying uh, thank you for coming for this talk. And I appreciate NUS for actually extending the invitation out to ExpressVPN to actually be able to send a representative down to give a talk. So, okay, I would like to share my screen and present. Give me a second. Okay, uh, can everyone see? So, is everything okay? Uh, yeah, okay. Can see, can see. Yeah, okay. All right, so thanks, uh, Ashley, for that very lovely introduction. So, sorry, today's talk will basically be about security at ExpressVPN. And I'll like to use uh, a topic which I have some passion for and something I find very interesting, which is the topic of phishing to actually give you guys a glimpse of what we do in cybersecurity at ExpressVPN. So before I start, just want to establish some context and background information. So ExpressVPN, who are we? If you ask your friends what ExpressVPN is or even any VPN service provider, I think one of the biggest answers that you get from people is that, oh, it allows you to watch uh, Netflix from USA or countries where it's, you can't watch those videos in Singapore but we are actually much more than that. So basically we provide a personal VPN service across multiple platforms. The most common ones that you will see are your operating systems like your Windows and Linux machines. You also have your mobile devices, but we actually do have our applications available for routers as well. And sometimes even your PlayStations and your Xbox 360s. So, Basically, if you have a device that can connect to the internet, we try our best to provide our application on the platform. Now, the values that we strongly believe in are privacy and security. And this is why we provide our product. We want to give our customers the best privacy and security that we can give them. A uh, good side note, a good thing to note is that like amongst the other VPN service providers, we are constantly and consistently ranked among the top by all these uh, websites that does assessments on the VPN services. So yeah. Now a bit of uh, information about myself. I think uh, Ashley has covered a bit of that. So I won't repeat those stuff that she's covered, but basically in short, I have been in the cybersecurity industry for coming up to two years. Oh, slightly just over two years. And I started at PwC as a security auditor first. So after about like maybe slightly over a year, I felt that like I needed a new change and a new challenge. So I looked around, sourced out, got some referrals and here I am at ExpressVPN. So I work mainly in the red team and my role is to conduct security assessments and sometimes carry out like red team engagement related work. Uh, along the way in my career, I did some certifications, which uh, some of you might be familiar with, like for example, your OSCP, OSWE, and these are to help bolster my skills in cybersecurity. And there are, along the way, I've worked with some very wonderful people, very high, highly skilled people. And I got a bit lucky last year where a group of my, myself and some of these people, we actually found some CVEs. And if you have an opportunity to check it out, I would recommend you to do so because uh, it's quite interesting where they are not exactly like standalone CVs, but we actually managed to chain together some CVs to achieve remote code execution, which in the hacking world, that is like your holy grail, your end, end game where you can start executing code on a remote machine. Okay. So some background about cybersecurity at ExpressVPN. We have three main departments, the red team, 
blue team and security engineering. So red team, that's where I'm from. We mainly do security assessments and red team engagements. Blue team, our defense, basically threat hunting, security operation, manning the security operation center as well. And lastly, we have security engineering. So it is an engineering role, but instead of like building web applications or building infrastructure, it's more towards like utilizing their engineering skill set to actually help bolster and improve the security posture of our company. So today's content, as shared previously, is going to be heavily focused on phishing. We will show it in three different perspectives. One, from the Red Team's perspective, and how to construct a phishing campaign to have the best successful rate possible. Second, we talk about email security. So after we construct it and we send it, now comes the blue team's portion where they have to try and analyze the email and see how to best spot that it's a phishing email. And in cases, if you have file attachments, how do you handle with those file attachments as well? And uh, lastly, security engineering. This one will be on a bit of a niche topic called Canary Tokens. So not to worry if you don't understand what it is, I will actually go a bit more into what it is in that segment later on. So without further ado, let's start with the red team segment on how to construct a phishing campaign. So for any red team engagements, and when we, when we start it off, we kick it off, right? We always want to do proper reconnaissance work. We have to know exactly our target and who are we attacking and maybe what are their weak spots which we can target. Right, so that is where we start off with. And if let's say, for example, like for, for this uh, whole talk, right, we'll be going the scenario where we're trying to attack ExpressVPN. So I couldn't choose any other like third party software to or company to target because that wouldn't be right to present this in a recorded meeting. So we're just going with ExpressVPN for, that, for this scenario. So imagine if I'm trying to attack ExpressVPN, I have to do some reconnaissance work on ExpressVPN. So there are a lot of uh, ways that you can get publicly available information. And one of it is the DNS records of a company. For example, like expressvpn.com, that domain itself, that our DNS records are publicly available and you can retrieve that. You can see your TXT records, your MX, your mail server records, and your DNS A records. On top of that, when you talk about phishing, we are sending things through email. We also want to look for spoofing uh, spoofing protection records. So some of them that are available on your DNS records are, for example, your SPF, Standard Policy Framework, and DTIM. So these things, not to worry, I will show in a short little screenshot later of what they are exactly. Uh, on top of that, you can also look for information on like uh, popular used websites such as uh, LinkedIn and GitHub. So if you are planning a very structured attack where you're attacking a single individual, any piece of information about that individual matters and it can help you craft a better story. So when we take a look at the DNS records, for example, of ExpressVPN, we can see the MS, MX records over here. You can see google.com, Google email, Google email, a lot of Google stuff. So you can start to see a picture that like probably ExpressVPN might be using Gmail, Gmail's client, right? Now the interesting part comes in the TXC records. So TXT records are basically like text records. They don't necessarily like, they don't route traffic basically, but they're, they're just text. But what you can actually grab from a domain's text records is so most of the time you can see like what are the third party software as a service, software as a service products that they're using. So if you look at the TXT records over here, you notice some things like Amazon SES, uh, there's Dropbox, there's Facebook, Google site, uh, there's Alessian as well, MS is, Microsoft and DocuSite. So these things are actually very good information because if I want to craft a phishing attack, it, I, can, I could possibly like masquerade, instead of masquerading as ExpressVPN, I can masquerade as one of these third-party software as a service companies because it's highly likely that if ExpressVPN uses them, the employee emails will be flooded with like emails from these third-party software as a service uh, coming from the, the emails coming from the third-party software as a service companies. So very, very good information here. The one thing I want to point your attention to is the last line, the V equals to SPF. So this is your sender policy framework uh, record over here. What it specifies basically is that if an email is sent with the expressvpn.com domain, that means at expressvpn.com, 
the email has to come from one of the mail servers that is over here. So this is actually a way to prevent people from spoofing expressvpn.com domain directly. If you send an email from a mail server that doesn't come from any of these mail servers, most likely the email client will flag the emails as, as spam. It will fail the SPF check basically. So these, these are things that we can look at from the DNS TXT reports. Now we move on to choosing a domain name. When we want to send an email, we have to send it with a domain. Uh, we have to think about what is the angle of our approach? Are we wanting to harvest some credentials or do we want to drop a malicious file? So you, you ask yourself, like, what type of email addresses do these mails come from? And the best place to actually like draw inspiration from is just look at your personal email inbox. Uh, you see your marketing promotions, you see emails from cases where you forget your password and you reset your password, you click reset my password, right? You notice that like these emails will come from mails like uh, they have like notifications or even support or no reply or no reply of a hyphen, sometimes even with admin as well. So this is giving me a rough idea as to like how I, what is the email account name that I want to choose. Now we talk about domains next, and the domain is basically the right side of the ad sign. For example, secretlab.co over here. So when it comes to domains, and more importantly, subdomains also, which is basically signified by the dot. So for example, like accounts.google.com is a subdomain of google.com. This is something where not many people actually pay attention to whether the domain is actually a subdomain of the original, original domain. So I'll introduce a nice little trick that we use in a red team sometimes is, is basically the hyphen versus the dot. So what do I mean by this? If you look at this little meme that I have over here, we have two email addresses. One is support-expressvpn.com followed by support.expressvpn.com. So based on what I explained earlier, support.expressvpn.com, the one below, this is actually a subdomain of expressvpn.com. To set this email up properly, you need to own expressvpn.com because you need to, to, to properly route the traffic accordingly. You have to modify the DNS records for the original expressvpn.com domain. Whereas support-expressvpn.com, it's a bogus domain, it's a new domain. I, I bought this domain for this demo. And the, the interesting thing to know is that like this domain actually costs like $8 a year. So it's very, very easy to just acquire it and it looks exactly like ExpressVPN. Like if you don't have a keen eye, you might actually believe that it's coming from expressvpn.com. So yeah. Uh, next thing, now that assuming we got our domain, we have to look at the SMTP server to use to send out our emails. We have to set up our mail servers basically. Uh, there are quite a number of third-party SMTP services which are free, they have a free tier to use and they are quite easy to set up basically. Uh, some of them are listed over here. You have Zoho, Mailgun, Sangrid, Amazon Simple Email Service. But uh, one thing we have to take note of is that some of them actually have like uh, protections for fraud and abuse. For example, people who utilize it for phishing campaigns. And they actually have some restrictions for new accounts specifically. So if you see in the screenshot I have over here, Amazon Simple Email Service actually has a sandbox environment for new accounts. So what it does is that for new accounts that just registered with them, you are only allowed to send emails to domains that you own. So if I draw back to my support-expressvpn.com domain, if I register with AWS SES, I only can send to emails ending with support-expressvpn.com. I cannot send it out to anybody else and it will be bad for me because I want to send to expressvpn.com if I'm targeting them. So, I tried an error around with third-party SMTP services and I landed with Zoho because they have the least restrictions and it's pretty straightforward to set up. Now, this portion next is a very, very important one. So, because when you want to send your phishing emails, first thing is you have to make sure that it does not land in the spam folder because how many of us actually check our spam folders, right? We look at our inbox only, do we actually extend the option down and click spam? Not many of us do so unless we know we are expecting something. So, main key part about this portion is that you have to try your best to identify the target's email client. So from the TXT records, we saw that ExpressVPN, probably Gmail, right? And then next thing, we have to look at domain reputation. So domain reputation, basically when you register for a domain, there is sort of a reputational score that type that comes with it. And the way you improve your reputation score is that you have to actually 
make sure that the emails coming out from this domain, it does not get marked as spam because this is actually noted down. On top of that, your domain age matters very much as well. So for example, if a domain who is like three to four years old and has been sending emails and has a rate of rejected and marked as spam as like maybe like two, 3%, you would say that the reputation of domain is quite high and highly likely when email clients receive it, it knows that it has a high reputation. It will not mark, it has lesser chance of marking the email as spam instead. And uh, why you need to identify your target's email client is because different email clients actually, they have different sensitivity of spam filters. So your email might actually work for a Outlook client and not marked as spam, but for a Gmail client, it can actually be marked as spam. So knowing where you're lending your email is, is very, very important. There are some things you can do to improve your domain reputation. And for phishing campaigns, when you construct it, the red team usually tends to send like their emails in incremental batches. And even better, if they have control over those recipient email accounts, they can just mark it as not spam, they can favorite it, they can just open those emails to make sure that they're being read and, and consumed. So you can work towards your target amount that you eventually want to send. For example, if you are wanting to conduct an employee-wide phishing campaign of like 500 employees, you can't be sending emails that like just 500 straight away. It has to work your way up slowly there. Now, lastly, you also have to watch out for URLs that are included in the email, not just like hyperlinks. So for example, your emails are HTML basically loaded in the browser. And if you have images inside your emails, they are probably included via image tags. You have to be very careful about your source attribute. So even if let's say you're loading like some meme from Google, Google search, right? If it's from an unrecognized domain or those, those, those kind of domains with like funny characters inside there, highly likely the email will be marked as spam as well. Okay. Lastly, I have given you a lot of pieces so far. We need the last final piece of glue to bring everything together. There are, there's this thing called phishing frameworks and what they are is basically this sort of like the, 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 the queen hive, the queen bee hive that like links everything together and manages your campaign. So what's very use, useful things that you can use phishing frameworks for is that like you can craft your email templates and landing page templates. What I mean by craft is that like you're trying to impersonate someone, right? So highly likely you want the emails and landing page to look like the target you're impersonating. Uh, phishing frameworks can help you literally just clone the page directly and clone the email templates as well. And it makes some small little changes on the code for it. So for people who want to engage in phishing campaigns, but they are not great coders, you start to panic at first that like, oh, how am I going to replicate a website? Here's your phishing framework, it'll do it for you and just make some minute changes for it. And on top of that, it can also track some very important metrics like the emails open, the links click, and if you want to harvest credentials, the credentials harvest that as well. So short little recap, you have, you do your reconnaissance, you choose your domain name after that, you know, based on how you want to structure your phishing story. Next, your SMTP service, which one you want to use. And four, how to avoid spam filters. This one is very, very important. Next, use the phishing framework, put everything together. Once it's done, step six, you can probably start sending emails. Over here, I would like to note it down that like in actual red team engagements, between step five and step six, it's actually good to try and test your emails out, whether they will land in spam or you actually reach the inbox. And there are some very interesting, readily available tools out there that helps that actually, it's open source. I, I, it's interesting why they're there. So what they do is that like, they can simulate certain email clients and on top of that certain security email gateways as well in like in industry security email gateways, for example, your trend micros, your, your top security companies, and you can send your emails against those barriers to see whether it will get past. So this is something that you might, you will probably want to take into consideration before you actually reach step six. So now that I've spoken quite a bit, I'd like to show a bit of demo of what I did. So, so this is GoFish, which is one of a very widely used phishing frameworks. Uh, mostly used for in-house phishing campaigns because it's very easy to set up and easy to use. So the context that I'll be showing today is that like, I am trying to sort of like fake a password reset email to an unsuspecting ExpressVPN customer. Now I have, wait, give me a second, let me move my Zoom panel away, it's blocking. 
Okay, I have uh, an email, pass uh, pa email password template over here. So I always like to demo it to you guys that I show you how it looks like. So, give me a second. Oh. oh, I am so sorry. I think my internet, I have some whitelisting rules on it. Give me a, sorry, give me a short moment. I need to stop sharing my screen and turn on something. Yeah. My apologies. I whitelisted it. So. <laughs> Okay, uh, can you can you hear me? Oh, uh, yep, yeah, can hear you. Yeah, sorry, I have to get on the same network as my. Yep, everything's loading. I can share my screen now. To share. Sure. Okay, you can see? Okay, good. Test it one more time. Yep, everything is loading. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, so this is the email template that I have created so far. Uh, if any of you are ExpressVPN customers and you, you've used our service before and you forgot your password, you would find this email familiar. So basically what I did was to actually use my own account to trigger a reset, get the email. I can throw this email into the HTML editor over here and it will just load everything up perfectly for me. The good thing on top of that is that it will help me change the source, the, the source URL attribute of the tag for this button to my landing page button. Now we go further, we look at the landing pages. So I am just trying to mimic the ExpressVPN login page to sort of like trick customers to enter their credentials inside that. So again, I go to the login page of the original site, take the HTML, grab it, put it inside here. And I have the Express VPN menu page over here. So this is basically a short, short example of like what you can do with GoFish. Now I have to also tie in with my SMTP service so that it knows where to which email servers to send emails from. And you basically just have to set up the sending profile. So over here I have created an account on Zoho Mail for no reply at support expressvpn.com. Uh, I'm using the default Zoho SMTP server, which is, you can see on your documentation, it's on port 587. I have to provide my authentication credentials so that because not anybody can just use the Zoho's SMTP service. And then once I set this up, I save the profile, I can effectively start sending emails. So I have two tests over here to, in, for the interest of time, but just to run you through how to send, send an email. You can just start your campaign name, choose which template you want. You can put, in this case, I'm directing it to support expressvpn.com, which is a domain I own. Then set the time, select your target group, and then launch the campaign. So I've already done this beforehand to save some time. I've sent it to both my Gmail and my Outlook accounts. So you can see over here inside my virtual machine that uh, I've received the email. And if you click on the link, it will actually redirect you to my phishing page. And you can see the domain support expressvpncom I took one step further to actually go and generate a HTTPS certificate to make it look more legitimate as well. Because if most browsers these days, if you're not on HTTPS, it will just flag you up immediately. And on my Gmail one, it, it went through nicely also. And the page is here. So that is basically a short they more like what you can do with regards to crafting phishing campaigns. Now I have, let me go back to sharing my slides. There's one interesting thing that I want to include in this red team segment over here. And that's basically the bonus portion of uh, Homoglyph IDNs. IDNs are basically international domain names. And why this is interesting is because uh, international domain names actually have special characters whereby uh, the alphabets in that native language is, uh, is it doesn't, it's, it's not similar to English characters. It looks a bit funky and uh, it's basically different, right? But the good thing for hackers or red teamers is that some of these character sets, right? Even though most of the characters are very different, there is a small number of them which looks exactly like English characters. But 
a computer will recognize it as not a non-English character. So the main uh, alphabet set that attackers have been exploiting is the Cyrillic alphabet set. It's basically your Russian characters. And these character sets, right, there are nine letters inside the Russian character set which looks exactly like English characters. So believe it or not, you see my third bullet point over here. These are all Russian characters, but the bottom row, they're all English characters. So what you can actually do with it is that like, if you can choose these letters and mix and match and craft a domain from there, you can actually sort of like spoof your somebody else. So I give you a short example, apple.com and apple.com. I'll be honest with you, one of it is Cyrillic and one of it is not, but even I myself have forgotten which is which over here. But I, I have another demo to show over here. So to show my point, uh, I have the apple.com one open over here. So this is a Cyrillic one. And you can see it's HTTPS in my browser. Okay, uh, my new, just, just uh, some background information. This is on the Firefox browser because I, I'll get into that in a bit, but just know that this is in Firefox browser. So it's showing apple.com and this is definitely not the apple.com website, right? If I go to my next step, this is the original apple.com website. So to show you, I'm not like local hosting this or I can refresh the page and it's going to load here again. So I went one step further. I saw the character set and I noticed that like I could probably form SpaceX with that as well. So I went to buy the SpaceX domain, which looks exactly like this English characters. And you can see this is the original SpaceX website, right? And then now this is my SpaceX website. Same thing, both are SpaceX and this is not SpaceX. So if you don't believe me, I made a minute difference. The original one has the three option bar over here and my one doesn't have. So this is how you tell that it's different. The other way you tell it's different is that like just earlier this week, SpaceX went to change their main photo. So it made my demo slightly less impressive because I didn't account for that change in the photo over there. But basically, this is a trick that attackers can use to trick people that they, they can masquerade as other entities also. So uh, there are some defense mechanisms for this. One of it is uh, Basically, for special characters domains, there's actually a separate representation for it called puny code representation, and it looks something like this. So when you register for that domain, you're actually registering xn dash dash at so on and so forth instead of, but but uh, instead of like the special characters itself. So on the browser, specifically the Firefox browser it will always show the Unicode representation. There is no like warning that like this might be a potentially dangerous site. Now, just some take home activity for you guys. I will send this in the chat later. You can try taking this URL and put it on Google Chrome and you see what happened over there. So you see that there are some def defense mechanisms in place. Okay. Uh, for good thing to know over here is that like different email clients also have different protections, uh, protections in place for these type of text. So for example, for Gmail, I, do, I didn't even send an email. I can just put it in the two header over here, the two field over here. And straight away, it throws me a, a warning message that somebody is trying to trick me with a domain that has similar characters. Whereas if I go to my Outlook email inbox, I send an email with that domain inside and it didn't even throw up any warning as well. So you can see that if I were to craft a email, uh, craft a phishing attack along these lines, I'll probably be wanting to target like Outlook accounts instead. I, I'll probably have a higher success rate there. And I can even put in that like, uh, please open this website in Firefox. It, it appears best there, you know, it loads the JavaScript properly or what, whatever you can think of. So yeah, with that, uh, we'll come to the end of the red team segment. So let's move on to the blue team side and the perspective when it comes to phishing the page. So first thing when the blue team professionals, they see a phishing email or they suspect a phishing email, what they will start with first is they want to analyze your sender's domain. Who sent me this email, right? Uh, for, first thing that might come to your mind is take copy paste the email address or the domain, put it on the browser and hit enter. Let's see where it brings me to, right? But there are some risks associated with doing so and you don't necessarily want to do that because it will disclose your source IP address and if you're not using a VPN, of course. And you don't want the attacker to know your source IP address because that is effectively your identity on the internet. There are some nice tools available to actually do some recon on the domain. 
some of it is like, for example, who is and you are scan.io. They are websites which can be reached easily. And the information that you want to get from them is, for example, your domain age, the domain owner, although domain owner can actually be very easily hidden when you register, register for domains through privacy settings. And from there, you make an analysis to see whether is it a legitimate website. So URL scan IO, for example, has a very interesting and very handy tool where it sort of like runs the domain in a sandbox and it screenshots the homepage for you. So you can actually see whether there's the has the attacker actually put in the effort to craft a proper homepage or, you know, or if the homepage looks a bit wonky, then you probably know it, it adds to the suspicion that it might be a phishing email. Now, after that, we have the full content of the email because we receive it in our inbox. The next thing we do is definitely to analyze the SMTP headers. So our emails, when we open them in our clients, they look very prim and proper and very nice, but that's not the actual format of our emails. There's actually a whole chunk of SMTP headers and HTML code along with a lot of other things. And some email clients, you actually can access that very easily. So for example, Gmail client, you click on the options button, and you can click on show original and you'll see the full chunk of text. Uh, things you want to look out for, your SPF, DKIM and DMARC flags, because this one will actually give you information on like whether the email has passed these checks. They'll tell you whether is this email probably spam or not spam. But if you have planned your phishing campaign properly, these checks are actually expected to be passed because these checks are targeted towards like if someone is trying to spoof your domain exactly. But in my case, I went with support hyphen ExpressVPN. That is not the expressvpn.com. I should have passed these checks, right? So you go on to the next step. You also want to check for the presence of phishing framework headers. So what I mean by this is, for example, I showed you the example of GoFish. Uh, GoFish by default actually includes a string text of using GoFish in the from headers when you send your emails. Meaning if someone inspects the email deeper, he will clearly see it's a dead giveaway that, oh, this guy is, is written right there. The email was sent from GoFish, right? You want to make sure that when you send emails out, it's not dead. And lastly, you also want to check on the SMTP service that is used to send the email. You can go back to the emails, the, the domain's SPF records to validate against the whether, whether the SPF records include an entry for the SMTP server that the mail came from. So some examples over here. See the, the first screenshot, you can see that like the using GoFish text was added to my from the form view. And this was something that I had to go and go into the GoFish code to remove the text completely to stop it from sending like that. Now, if we look deeper at like the SMTP headers, we can see that your DKIM, DMARC, SPF is passed because I have set up support hyphen ExpressVPN with the proper DNS records and it's a separate domain from expressvpn.com. Now, interesting thing to point out over here is that you can also see that it came from Zoho Mail. But if we look at ExpressVPN's TXT records, you, don't, you do not see any entry for Zoho Mail, right? So it, it gets a bit suspicious as to like, ExpressVPN has set up its mail service properly and everything is nice, it has proper DNS records. Why is a mail coming from another domain entirely and also from another mail server, right? It's, it's, it points to, it gives rise to the, the possibility that this is probably a phishing email. So your SMTP is also, SMTP headers are a very, very good source of information. Now, we, 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 we have obviously have to analyze the email as well, right? We have to look at the con what's the context of the email and look out for certain branding inconsistencies like your spelling mistakes and color differences. Uh, we also want to see whether it is the email trying to like evoke a sense of urgency to click on a open an attachment or click on the hyperlink. And you have to ask yourself, do you usually receive such emails from such an organization? And in a screenshot over here, I think one way or another, over the past five to 10 years, we've more or less come across this phishing email in different variations where it's probably telling you that like uh, your iCloud account has an outstanding balance and you have to clear the balance. And yeah, so you, you have to ask yourself, should, should you be receiving, receiving this email? Is it asking you to click on something? And from there, make the, make a deduction through, through the information you've gathered. Okay. Uh, this segment is a bit different. This is more towards uh, emails that come with file attachments and specifically your Excel attachments or your doc attachments because 
these type of emails, uh, this type of uh, file file types are heavily favored by attackers due to the fact that they can include macros. And through macros, you can actually do a lot of very, very interesting things. So I decided to include this portion as well. So obviously good hygiene is that if you come across this, try your best not to open the file and analyze it on your own. If you have an internal security team, it's always good practice to just send it to them and let them do the work from there. Uh, first thing you can do, there is a very nice tool called Virus Total Online. And what you want to do is actually try to submit the hash of that file. I, I highlight again the hash of the file, not the file directly, on Virus Total to actually see whether the file has been analyzed before. Because if other securities around the world have, have analyzed the file, you'll be able to see the results of this file. So why you want to do this is because you want to ascertain whether is this a broad scale attack or is this more of like a localized, like a more targeted kind of attack. And if you see on virus total that this file has been analyzed before, you more or less know that like this is probably like more towards a spray and pray method where someone is just trying their luck. Whereas like if you don't see that, it, it could mean that it's a new attack or it's something, uh, something that's not been seen before. So again, similar to the domain analyzing, it's good practice not to submit the whole file on virus total because Virus total is accessible publicly. You don't want your attackers to know that like they are be their, their attack and payload is being analyzed as well. Uh, after that, you can also do some high-level metadata analysis on the file. And sometimes certain operating systems come with very interesting tools which can you can just run it on the file and see some interesting data points about the file. Uh, for example, if you are a hacker, you're familiar with Kali Linux, it comes with this tool called Exif2. And for this demonstration, we took a malicious file, which was labeled urgent underscore news dot doc, and we did some high level analysis on it. So we get things like the author, the numbers of edits, the total edit time, even the software version used to create the files and other things as well. Uh, one thing I want to point your attention over here is that if you see the template, it says normal dot m. This is quite a big red flag already because dot uh, m is basically a type of uh, word document but specifically, it allows you to save macros in it. So if you look at your Microsoft Word document these days and you save your file, you can come out as .docx, right? So on .docx, you cannot save the file with macros inside. Even if you like, you save it, by the time you open again, the macros are not going to be there anymore. Uh, other things you want to pay attention to is like you look at the edit time, the total number of edits. For this one, it has uh, five, five edits, if I remember correctly. Let me shift my Zoom panel away five edits, but the total edit time is uh, six minutes. So it's a bit suspicious that like, how come there's so many edits, but the person has only spent six minutes on the file. It points to maybe some copy pasting of macros or certain, it's just basically copy pasting and it might not be a legitimate file. So here is a good way to get some information and help to build a case to, to be able to deduce whether it's a phishing email or not. Uh, sorry. We move on to sandbox environments. So now when the file is in the hands of blue team professionals, the thing that they can do with it is they actually want to see what happens when they actually execute the file, right? But they need a safe way to do so. So they make use of sandbox environments where you, it's sort of like a virtual machine environment where you can execute the file. And when you run the file there, you want to be monitoring like things like your file creates and file modifications to see what the malicious file is doing. Registry changes, especially if there's a Windows operating system. Uh, you want to look for beaconing to a command and control server, which is very red team each type of behavior where they have a malicious implant. And from there, once it executes, it starts beaconing, sending things back to a control server. And these are the main few things you want to look out for to determine what the file is going to do. Uh, on top of that, there's something called OLE analysis. This is specifically for your Microsoft uh, Microsoft Office files because they follow this OLE object linking and embedding structure. And there are very good security researchers out there who have written very nice Python scripts to help you analyze these files. So what I mean by analyze these files is, for example, the first script, your OLE dump, it can actually help you dump out the macros on that file. And then the second one, OLE VBA, it goes one step further and analyze the macros to see what exact, which, which macro functions it's actually calling on. Now, why macros are dangerous? This is 
is, is because uh, macros is it, it has access to OS level APIs, specifically your Windows APIs. And it can do things like create scheduled tasks. It can do process injection, which is how people like hide their payloads and run, run secretly in people's computer. It can also do this thing called sandbox protection, which basically if you have some macros written at the start before it actually executes its true intention, right? So what it checks for is that it can, for example, you see a screenshot, it checks that is there a mouse active? Is there a screen size greater than X amount? Can the host play sound? Is this a Windows machine? So it knows that like, if I am in a sandbox environment, right? I am not going to execute my macros. So meaning if we go back to the sandbox example previously, if the, the, the macros has very nice sandbox protection code written in there, if I run it in a VM, highly likely it's not going to show its true colors. And it just, it looks, it looks like nothing is happening. So these are some things that your macros can do. And this is why you have to look at it properly. So example over here, your OLE dump, it dumps out the macros. And OLE VPA, VBA, sorry, it goes deeper to actually show you like, for example, your virtual alloc X. Uh, and it gives you a description that like, it may inject code into another process. So why would a legitimate Word doc or Excel file macro contain, uh, contain macros that are actually using these type of commands? So this is where you get a better picture on how to analyze your file attachments. Uh, there's this bonus portion over here where you have a new type of phishing attacks where people are actually trying to bypass emails instead and sending using different mediums to send you unsolicited messages. And on top of that, through these mediums, they include their links and their downloads and their file attachments as well. So for example, LinkedIn, you skip the whole process of email filters. You don't have to evade anything. I can just reach the guy there already. And on top of that, like I can even like craft something based off his uh, LinkedIn profile. And there are quite a number of financial institutions who have been victims to this. So this is like an added dimension for what blue team professionals have to be careful about. And they really have to educate their staff to be able to spot these kind of things because they, they, it's a, they have to work hand in hand together. It's not the blue team Superman and do everything. The staff have to play their part to identify and flag out these things so that blue team professionals can do the work that they supposed, they're supposed to do. Okay. Uh, lastly, we move on to canary tokens in the security engineering portion. So what canary tokens are is that like we go in the case of like you assume that you have been breached. Uh, it's good that organization has ways to be able to identify when they have been breached as well. As soon as possible would be best, right? So canary tokens are basically like your honeypot traps that we leave inside our defense. Like we assume that like the attacker has got, gotten past our defense, right? So we put traps within our environments such that like we, and the traps are designed to actually like trick attackers to click on it or to activate those traps. So we know straight away that somebody has set off the trap, right? In the case of cloning of web pages, which is very important for phishing and pates, what we can do over here or what companies do is that they have a canary token, which is basically a callback function that calls to a listening server. But what they do is they hide this canary token somewhere in the code. It could be an image tag, JavaScript, any, anything to up to your imagination, as long as you can slot it in somewhere. And what the canary token does is that, let's say it's a JavaScript, right? When the page, someone loads the page and a JavaScript gets loaded, right? It will match against the domain that is being loaded at. And if that domain doesn't match, for example, like let's say google.com is implementing canary tokens. If that domain doesn't match google.com, it will execute the callback function and let us know that somebody has cloned their page already. So this is a very, very nice way to be able to identify who has cloned your page. And it's not so easy to, if you're trying to clone a page, it's not so easy to find out where this has been implemented because there are many ways to obfuscate this. Now, uh, where's my page? Okay, we can also detect breaches in uh, employees' emails, for example. So if an attacker has access to somebody's email, what will this attacker be doing? He'll probably be like rummaging through the email, searching for specific keywords, right? So how we do it is that the security engineers they actually implant a fake email with a very eye-catching subject header, maybe like, oh, financial reports, uh, urgent, something like that. And then inside the contents, I can craft something like, uh, you can view our financial report, in finance, uh, the report in the finance portal. And here are your one-time login credentials, click here. 
But behind that hyperlink is actually a, executing the callback function to the listening server to let you know that somebody has set off the trap. And basically, that's how you can structure it to protect your emails as well. And we talk about protecting like terminals, laptops, and workstations. We can take a leaf out of our attacker's book and leave certain doc, uh, Microsoft Office files, for example, your Excel files, your Word document files, with macros also, similar to what attackers does. And in this case, when they open the files, highly likely they will enable the content because they wouldn't expect these type of files to be on like but they are, they are victims computer, right? And when they enable the content, again, it gets the callback function gets executed. So interesting here to know is that like the way we can name the files, it can be like user credentials, for example, which is very, very bad practice, but people still do it. And yeah, so that's how you sort of like get attackers to think they you you, you think through their their eyes basically like what is their mindset and like what are their post exploitation actions and what they'll do and that's how you choose where you want to plant your traps there's a last portion over here where you can even protect your cloud environments as well so let's say we talk about aws you can access your aws environments through the command line and it's basically just download the aws cri package install it and you can access it through that some canary token vendors they actually allow you to generate like canary token aws credentials and what you can do with it is that for example most uh, the aws cri allows you to save certain profiles on a on a file on a directory in your on your local system you can actually place like the canary tokens inside there inside the profile as a specific profile uh, the more eye-catching the profile, the better because you want people to click on it. So for example, I can save the credentials with uh, under the name of admin profile. And if an attacker is targeting, for example, like a web developer's uh, machine, he will definitely be looking for AWS credentials because that is effectively like accessed directly into your, 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 your victim's like production network, right? And if he triggers and logs in with the Canary token credentials again, I'll receive a callback. My the organization will receive a callback, and you'll know that somebody has breached our environment. So yeah. Uh, with that, thank you for listening, and I apologize if it overran a bit. I try my best to wrap everything up, and uh, I'll be happy to take some questions. For do I? I have like ten minutes like that, right? Am I right? Yep. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. It'll be nice to hear from. Some of you. Right. Ah, okay. Uh, so Jivesh has asked a very nice question. Why are services like Goldfish publicly available? Um, most of the time, these things are available for like educational purposes and also for red teamers who want to conduct phishing campaigns. So uh, one some, some things that most red teams do is that like, let's say it's an internal red team, they conduct phishing campaigns against their employees to ascertain exactly like what is their security posture? Like do they know what to do when they, when they are faced with a phishing campaign? And using these phishing frameworks, it actually can make things a lot easier and make things more seamless. So it's obviously meant as a educational tool or a way to make red teamers jobs easier, but at the same time, you can use it for malicious activities, right? Because at the end of the day, like Goldfish is basically like a web console behind, and as a website that if let's say you can modify the code to suit your own purpose, it'll work perfectly fine as well. Right? So it goes both ways. And it is the same for a lot of like security open source tools also whereby the initial idea is to help red teamers do their job, but how the tool is utilized is, up, is, is fair game to anybody who has the chops to try and make changes to the code and do something to it. Yeah, and I hope that uh, answers your question. Yep, thanks. Actually, um, can I also ask, so you mentioned the, the IDN trick, right? Where you can yeah. have a domain that looks exactly the same, but it's a different uh -huh. thing. Uh -huh. you, you showed like, like that IDN is compiled or something to a 
a different URL. URL code. Right, yep. yeah. So if you're just looking at the URL, there is no sort of way to differentiate, is it? Yeah, correct. Oh, okay. It's almost impossible. So, okay. Uh, I Is there any way that I can like share some info or like I can send you the slides after this so that you can copy, maybe you can share it with everyone for them to try. Yeah, sure, I'll okay. leave the website on so I can just drop you a mail and send you the slides, right? Can, okay. Sounds great. Okay. Oh, great. Yep. Uh, there's actually more questions on the chat. So I think Andy asked, um, are there resources in which they can you can teach how to tune PHP Apache. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure if it's if it's okay. Uh, uh, I I I can I I can answer that. Like uh, this one is more towards like uh, system reliability work, which is not exactly my 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 main field. I would definitely recommend at first hand that maybe you might want to try like. Uh, uh, playing around with the load balancer options and all together also like I believe like the AWS offers a free tier for students or for new accounts the T2 micro for EC2 maybe you can try using a higher tier a bit it might help with handling load yeah aside from that like if you have like a application firewall or load balancer to and set some rules on there to handle the traffic coming in it might help with DDoS attacks so. Oh, There's okay. also a question on um, do you have any tips for people looking to specialize in red teaming? Mm, I do have some tips, and uh, I, I think this is a question that if you like to know more, you can speak to me personally. I actually have a slide here which uh, provide my email address, and you can any one of you can feel free to drop me an email. Aside from that, like we do have job openings in the security department at ExpressVPN. And if you'd like to speak to any of us or find out more about what we do, you can reach out to either myself or our head of security at these email addresses. Yeah. Okay. And we also have a question about, so like how do you take these concepts for mail phishing and transpose them to mobile social media? So if you share images, GIFs, videos, um, and sometimes they get auto-downloaded, is there a way to protect against that? Is that something Red Teamers um, try to do? Mm, that's not something that I have tried, but uh, what I do know is that like, for example, you mentioned like your third party social media apps, or let's say we talk about like, um, at a workplace, people use Slack, right? So some of these applications, what they actually do is like, let's say you include a link inside the message before you send to someone, right? some of these applications go a step further to actually analyze the link first. And they can actually, even on those applications, which is not an email client, uh, throw you warnings and let you know that like, this is a malicious link or it's a malicious site. So uh, sometimes it comes inbuilt, but at the same time, I have to emphasize that like we always should not click on links blindly also, whether or not it's from family member chat, that kind of thing, send on your Telegram chats or any medium which people can send you things. It's always good hygiene to look at the domain properly to make sure you're going to where you want to go exactly. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I think at this point we can uh, wrap up the questions already. Uh, thanks so much, Timothy, uh, for the presentation. Um, oh, yeah, you're, most yeah, you're, you're most welcome. Yeah, you're most welcome. Yeah, you, I think today you taught a lot of us how to do phishing and uh, I think someone cracked a joke about how we're NUS hackers and you're really, uh, I'm not going to say you're really teaching hacking because that's illegal and we don't do that. But yeah, thanks. It was really super mm -hmm. fun. So yeah, do, um, do hang around for the next talk if you want. But thanks so much for coming down. Yeah. I actually have to make a move, but I will send you whatever I do. I'll send sure. you first before I move. Yeah. And okay. uh, share the materials on the channel. Just want to say hi to the next speaker. I apologize that I can't join, but all the best and have a good talk. All right. Thanks so much. Right. Thank you so much, man. I will drop off from the call now. Thanks, sure. Timothy. All right. Bye. Yep. And hi, everyone. So um, we'll be moving on to our, our next talk by Kai from Codework. Um, so I think so. Kai is an engineer at uh, is an engineering lead at Topworks. Uh, he, yep. So he'll be talking about five tips to make you a better engineer. So I'll just hand over the time to him.
Thanks, guys. Thanks, Javish. Uh, how much time do I have, actually? Um, so you have until eight, typically. Like sure. we, we let the talk go until like forty-five minutes, and then we use the other fifteen minutes for Q and A. Yep. Okay. Cool. Well, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm all for the Q and A and interaction. This is my uh, my social outlet for Friday night. So, um, yeah, um, my name's Kai Hendry. Sorry. Got my alarm going on. Can it? Can everyone see me clearly and all that stuff? My audio is okay. Yep, we can. Hear I'll, I'm gonna. Since I'm trying to be professional, I'm gonna use some slides. Does it? Do, do people typically use slides, or they just talk, or something random? Will they show their screen? Oh uh, wait, <laughs> you can just show your slides. Um, that's that's all right. Okay, so everyone can see my slides now, right? Oh uh, yep. I'm kind of surprised there's so many people on this call. Don't you guys watch YouTube or something like that? <laughs> okay, cool. So let's begin. So apologies for the very lame sort of topic of the of the talk, but I, I didn't really know what to present to you guys. And I guess you're all students. So I thought to myself, well, I'll just give you some like top tips, how to become an awesome engineer. And I'm assuming most of you are like still in students, right? In NUS. Is that right? Yep. Usually most of the audience is um, students. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, yeah, just so you know, um, yeah, my name is Kai Hendry. I went to university in ooh, 98 and I graduated in 2004 with a master's degree at the University of Helsinki. And interestingly, I was a researcher at, in my last year and my research uh, professor mentor guy said to me, Hey, I should go to NUS next if I want to continue in research, but I decided not to go continue in research. I instead um, went traveling. I, I put a backpack on, on my shoulders and I just, just went traveling for about like two or three years. And then I ended up meeting my Malaysian wife and now I live in Singapore. Bit weird, but you know, that's the story. Okay, so let's get started. So I just wanted to first point out that you guys as students of computer science, I think you all made a, a pretty good decision because the time and age that we're living in right now is the information age. It isn't the, I don't know, building uh, architecture age. It isn't, I don't know, the steam age anymore. It's the information age. So we all are at the cusp of this revolution, right? I was born in 1978 and, you know, like I remember as a kid with, you know, computers weren't really available, like the first PC just came about and I feel pretty lucky just to be on the forefront of this of, of this revolution and you guys are like the second generation I think it's bloody awesome you guys are in for a bloody roller coaster I'm sure so uh, of course my first tip is that you're going to have to have that growth mentality you're going to always be learning and when I when I graduated from University of Helsinki I I, I uh, probably I probably thought that I might know enough to do my job or something like that. But then when I started working and things like that, I always felt like a bit overwhelmed, a bit like I didn't know enough or something like that. But that's all I just wanted to say that, like, you all you all are absolutely fresh and you're all going to learn so much by the time, I don't know, 10 years and 20 years down the line. So you're always going to be learning. It just never ends and you've got to have the right attitude to it and you've got to have like a pretty good approach like um like i highly recommend uh i don't know if you heard about these things called blogs does anyone know what a blog is i recommend blogging <laughs> i recommend um uh, there's like really quite there's really cool tools like um like pinboard to like you know keep your bookmarks in a nice place so that you can find what you've been searching for and save things you you when i say always be learning you need you need to establish like a pretty good approach to collecting information and 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 you got to remember that your your mind you know we're living in the age of google you're probably not going to remember much like i do you're going to have to be carefully organizing all the information that you uh, get or well, someone's got their uh, um, microphone unmuted i don't know who's that it's not me let me just figure out how to fix that. Um, please go. 
so yeah uh, just, uh, hopefully you have a system that works for you if you don't i mean don't panic but like you you'll you need to get a system to assimilate all the information that you you are learning all the time and for example i i blog quite a lot so so basically if i wanted to find out things i basically you know go foobar site database.com if i just want to find something that i wrote before or something like that my, my 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 blog is actually a mess i don't actually recommend you reading it it's just like but it's just my personal knowledge base right it's just where i collect stuff and i have other little methods too but like that's that's what i reckon you don't you don't need like you know the latest notion or something like that just just go for it so always be learning that's top tip number one now this is where it gets a little bit tricky and i know people will probably think i'm a bit weird by suggesting this but you need to grow a skin you need to work in public and to be honest like the first things that i've done online are like incredibly embarrassing like if you dig around some old mailing lists on python i think i i gave like i asked the most stupid question like why doesn't my print work or something like this it was just ridiculous and i was embarrassed by it for like you know i was ashamed by my own uh, uh, you know, stupidity by asking such a stupid question. Um, and then of course, you know, like when you go, I don't know if anyone, any of you guys are, are on IRC. I, I, I live on IRC for, for the last 20 odd years. Like you, 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 you're going to get people, you, you know, you're going to get trolls and things like that, who are, who say to you, like, you're an idiot. And, um, yeah, I'm, I, I have been an idiot many, many a time. But you need to learn, you need to be brave enough to basically work in public and keep on publishing no matter what, even though you're going to look like an idiot for, for years, probably like I have, if you look at my old stuff, but you'll get better. And, and then it doesn't happen overnight, but like when, once you contribute and do your thing on, uh, online, you know, you'll get that, op you'll get that like golden opportunity that golden moment when someone gives something back to you something like that really like spurs you on or tells you about something you, you didn't know about and you just like yay i learned something amazing and you do that yeah by working in public and of course we're living in the covid world right now it's difficult to attend conferences and make human con human connections but for me making human connections have been like the biggest accelerator of my career right I, I think that's I think that's what sets me apart from from maybe my contemporaries who who knows is that uh, I, I make it I make an effort to basically talk to people and and seek out people who I think uh, are, are interesting and things like this and 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 keep in touch with people you know um, so yeah work in public guys I hope you're all publishing something in public at this point. Uh, another tip is work on your workflow. You know, some people, I think some people can argue that like, if you spend, uh, you know, an ungodly amount of hours on your Linux desktop and your Vim configuration and, or your Emacs configuration, you're a bit of an idiot. And I would agree with them to some extent, but to be honest, I've spent a long time configuring my workflow and I think I've just reaped like rewards from it, like these little, you know, incremental gains over a long period of time. You know, I, I, I know my tools pretty well. I know, I know Vim, I know make, I know all the little things to make everything work. And I invested a lot of time, which, which probably looks a bit, look, sounds a bit daft, but yeah, I'm in a really comfortable place. And I encourage you to always think about the way that you go about tackling any problem as a, as like a, just think about the workflow because it's not just your editor, right? It's your compile cycle. It's your iteration cycle. It's your, your testing cycle, all these things, they're all are so important to, to, to get right. Like, for example, I've been working in JavaScript lately and it just kind of sucks um, compared to working in Go because you don't have the strong typing and all that stuff. And it, like you make mistakes and, and you, and the editor doesn't really tell you, but with Go, it's so much better. Anyway, that's my, my Go uh, um, uh, tip for you. But yeah, work on your workflow. You'll, and, and, and it's also important to like, you know, establish 
especially if you're like advanced in your career and you're like working with other people, like help people also get to that workflow because you need to iterate quickly. That's how you innovate. You have to have a fast uh, iteration cycle. You have to have great tooling. You got to get there and, and you got to focus on your tools uh, to do that, in my opinion. We, we can debate about this afterwards. The next uh, tip for you is make minimal programs. What the hell does that mean? Well, it's just something that I've done as, as, a, as a bit of a habit for many years. And I, I, it probably has a better name. Like maybe it's called prototyping. Maybe it's called spiking. Maybe it's called something else. But like if I'm coding something, if I'm programming something, I usually try make the, the little program in like a code pen in like a go play playground. I'm sure some of you are doing this already. You want to do something, code it outside the main code base in a little, I don't know, gist or something like that. Figure it out first before you bring the feature inside the code base. I highly recommend you do that. I think, uh, you know, I've just seen it. I've just seen people who I've worked with like try, oh, we're gonna implement this new feature. Let me just code it quickly into the main, uh, you know, main loop or something like this with all the millions of other things and they, there's some you know unintended side effect or something like that and and of course when you when you're making minimal programs it's much easier to share much easier to debug much easier to you know work with i just just do it guys just yeah just take my word for it make minimal programs and you'll get uh, you'll get far Oh my gosh, I'm right. I'm right. I'm raging through this. I think we're going to all have an early night. So test your code. I mean, every time someone tells me test your code, I usually just like well, whatever, dude, you're boring me. It's it's test driven development sucks. And I agree test driven development does suck. I wouldn't uh, approach that in that case. I wouldn't say you got to write tests before you write code. I, I, my colleagues will disagree with me. I, d I, don't, I don't write tests before I code. Nope, I don't do that. What I mean by testing your code is more to do with, um, you know, if you have code, yeah, do write tests. Test your behaviors. Test your behaviors is key. And then go that next step, like, you know, have some CI, CD in your, in your code, in your, you know, in, uh, introduce a GitHub action. Do some do some testing. Uh, uh, do the CI/CD in that regard. Make sure your code is always working, like in that regard. And uh, what I highly also suggest that you guys get into because everyone seems to be hiring for these sort of jobs lately. Is like monitoring, like you know, getting Prometheus going, instrumenting your thing, doing these extra things on top of your. On, on top of your application, I, I think it, it adds an incredible amount of value, especially when you your software is a bit more serious, a bit more commercial, a bit more in production. Like you might have the best code, you might, you know, you might be, I don't know, what's a good piece of software? I mean, you could have an Nginx HTTPD or something. I don't know, is that a good piece of software? Who knows? But if you're not monitoring that web server is up, then you're not doing half the job. You have to get uh, some sort of testing and monitoring ethos going. Uh, otherwise, you're just not professional, in my opinion. You know, you're just not professional unless you test your code. And, and yeah, just just to reiterate, and when I say test your code, it's not test driven development, necessarily. Because I certainly don't do that. I don't know who does that. Like, okay, so never mind. Okay, next tip, seek inspiration. So, you, you know, you might, okay, you're probably not, but like the reason why I transferred to University of Helsinki in Finland from my University of Bath in the UK, the reason why I transferred, well, there's a couple of reasons, but uh, one of the reasons was because I, I heard about Linux. I thought, wow, this Linux thing, seems to be really cool and interesting. Where did it come from? Oh, it came from some guy in the University of Helsinki, a computer science department. Oh, I wonder if I can go there and see what's happening. I went there to uh, University of Helsinki computer science. Of course, Linus was long gone, but you know, there were some very, very good people there. 
there are people that was were using Linux. Okay, um, not as much as I hoped for, but you know, whatever. And then when I was there, um, you know, I met a lot of other people who 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 were really good, and it was all because I was kind of brave enough or dumb enough to just go to where I thought it was happening. You know, fast forward to 2021. I mean, where is it happening nowadays? Uh, nowhere. I mean, maybe probably, you know, Silicon Valley or something like that. And I think as Singaporeans, you all can quite easily go and work in, in Silicon Valley with your visas and all that stuff, hopefully. But I encourage you, if, if you if you come across a, some software that you like, you know, drop an email to the author. You know, it's not that hard to figure out who wrote that software half the time, even if it's commercial stuff, which I would I would recommend you avoid. Just connect with the author or the scene or the community. Just go, go out there and figure it out, man. I don't know if you recognize. Does anyone know what that uh, that mascot is, by the way? I, I'll give you I'll give you five dollars if you know what it is. Does no one know what that is? Oh, my God, you youngsters. This is Glenda, and it's the mascot of Plan 9. And after going to University of Helsinki and discovering Linux, whatever, I discovered Plan 9. And you might be wondering, what's Plan 9, Kai? What's Plan 9? Plan 9 is like, uh, like an experiment by like Rob Pike and... Uh, and other like amazing people from you know Bell Labs and creating like a next level Unix operating system. It's got some very very cool ideas, and I recommend you check it out. And that's the mascot, Glenda. And basically, Rob Pike and Russ Cox, basically pl Plan Nine of Lonely, went on to create the Go programming language at Google. So, what I'm trying to say here is that the p the, Behind software is people, and some of the people, and 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 you should track them down. And you know, people they, they know people. You know, you, you can you can treat, you can you, you know, screw uh, making a family tree of like Linux distributions. Make make a tree, you know, a, a tree of uh, all the people that worked on different distributions. You'll you'll find uh, that some people really stand out. And I encourage you to, to track them down and learn from them uh, somehow. And that's really inspired me to, to be a computer scientist, I would say, is, is things like this. I'm, I'm just in awe when I, when I check out Plan 9 code and things like this. And it's been also like my bedrock of understanding because, you know, how many times have I walked into uh, a customers or clients or you know, whatever, it doesn't matter. How many complicated code bases have I seen? How many enterprise serial bus messes have I seen? But there's such beauty and simplicity. And, and this is basically what, um, what Plan 9 has given me. It's given me a philosophy. It's given me a way of thinking and reasoning about all things software and computers and things like this. And it's really been my bedrock. So I really encourage you to get a philosophy like that. Or community like that. Um, what's next? Oh my gosh, that's it. That's that's me. That's my that's my talk. I um I wanted to also add that you know besides seeking inspiration, just also make sure you get a lot of exercise for Christ's sake. Don't be a loser and <laughs> and. Uh, spend too much time behind the computer screen you really need to go for a run or something like that it really uh, i mean you all know that when you're like just today in fact i was debugging this crazy problem and it was only when i took a break and walked around and had a cup of tea i managed to solve it so yeah it's really important to to basically um you know not burn out get some exercise and all do and all that other stuff so yeah now I hope we can talk about how wrong I am, and uh, and 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 I'd be interested to hear if you guys had any. Uh, you know, like I'm all, I'm keen to learn from you guys. You know, what what motivates you to do computer science? Are you going to hack my computer or something? 
Don't do that. You won't find anything on this computer. Yeah. So, uh, we do want to clarify, like, yeah, NES Hackers doesn't do hacking. It's okay. Uh, we, we oh, it's a, it's a joke. I know you guys yeah. don't do hacking. Yeah, of course. Of course. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, actually, I had one question about about one of your um. So, like, one of the first things you mentioned about um always be learning, because okay, I mean, you, the the talk was framed as five tips for engineers, um, and at the same time, like, always be learning feels like something I might say to anyone, um, regardless of where or what they they are occupied with. So, do you think it's distinct in any way for engineers in terms of like? where they should learn from or how they should learn? It's distinct for engineers. Well, well, like, well I mean, I would, you, you guys are, I mean, you guys are all on Hacker News, right? <laughs> you know, you gotta, you gotta get your ways and things like that. I mean, I'm not gonna tell you exactly how to do it. I mean, I can, but like, you all have to figure out your way. Yeah, it's, the, I mean, always be learning is probably not the, the, not what I wanted to say. I wanted to say more like you got to get like quite a good structure because you the the things that you learn will um, you know compound or whatever with interest over time, especially if you're well organized about it. So and and then and then the other thing I was thinking is that like at least this is how my brain has evolved. Like I don't know I, when I went to school, you were expected to remember things, but you know fast forward. I think, I think you just got to remember the keywords, right? You got to remember like the tag in order to look up the information, right? That you need at hand. So this is, uh, so this is what you need to do. You got to figure out that sort of learning approach. And I don't, I'm not too sure if it's particular to engineers, but it might be. Who knows? I don't know. <laughs> you, you, I mean, let's be honest. I think in in software, um, you have to know an incredible amount of stuff. An incredible amount of stuff, uh, and it's it's and you have to be yeah. And if you ask me what the stuff is, I probably wouldn't know, but I kind of know where to look or something like that. Anything? Anything else? Oh, maybe I, maybe I ask some of these questions. Um, you mentioned writing blogs. How do you write blogs to keep uh, track of your knowledge? How do I write blogs? Um, I use I use Hugo, and I basically have lots of aliases or whatever functions. I just type like Hugo new, and then the name of the blog. I type it in Markdown in in Vim. I shift ZZ to to save, and I git add, and I and I and I commit it. And if you look at my if you look at my blogs, you'll probably see that most of them are pretty low quality. But some of them I evolve and some of them get good, but you, you, you'll never know which ones they are. I mean, I know which ones are the better ones and things like this. Um, I think the important thing is to just, it's just to find a workflow again, to, to basically put stuff online as quickly and, and frictionless as possible. And yeah, that's what I do. And uh, yeah, it's worked out pretty well for me. I, I'm very reliant on it uh, to do stuff. Uh, writing minimal programs. Yeah, I mentioned CodePen. Uh, front end dev. Um, yeah, I, I, I do write minimal programs, uh, not necessarily in CodePen. You know, I have, I have like, uh, like a, a Go template that I usually use or like a, a Vue.js uh, template or something like that. Uh, for a database, I, I, I usually lean on SQLite or something like that, maybe. I usually co coordinate most of my work with Docker Composed, YAML. But anyway, I'm very, very careful to make minimal programs. And if, if you look at my GitHub, it's a disgrace. It's, I think I have about, I don't know, how many repositories do I have? 209. So... I mean, these are the things I published. I mean, most most of the things are unpublished, right? I um, I mean, all of you guys, I'm sure, are doing something similar. I hope, but you just got to get into the habit of doing it. Uh, yeah, more often. It's 
it's probably well, yeah what i'm trying to say is not it's not about quality it's about quantity seriously so just just pump it out guys and uh, and hopefully you'll strike gold one day or learn something along the way or something like that um kai i had a question to ask actually a couple of them oh sure yeah so first up i'm just curious to know like um what are the, some of the some of the blogs you read you like to read are there some like frequent um things you love to read um yeah to be honest i don't read blogs anymore <laughs> so you just write them i just write them uh th there's a few blogs i kind of look forward to like the, the the go blog i guess you know the, it's quite high quality stuff mm -hmm. um but typically yeah like I, i'm i'm just on twitter half the, more than most of the time i'm just scanning things I, I don't have time to read blogs so much anymore um yeah i mean i feel like i'm a viral I'm the, I'm a real victim here because like, I, I was just trying to read a, I was just trying to like read a book the other day. I'm, I'm really struggling to read anything long format. It's like, I'm just too like copy paste, uh, Google, uh, you know? Yeah. So I guess Twitter is, is where I get most things from. I, I don't really read anything long form. Um, you know, I must confess like ThoughtWorks gave me like an O'Reilly subscription and I'm like, I, I scanned through the O'Reilly bookshelf and I was like, pfft, none of it appealed to me. So I'm not saying don't, I'm not saying be like me, but this is the way I am. I mean, I'm, I'm also heavily reliant on YouTube. Like if I want to learn something, I'm like, how do I secure this website in YouTube and see, <laughs> see what happens half the right. time. Interesting. Got it. Um, yeah, I, uh, really, I guess a question that's a bit not really related at all, which was, um, so you could have worked at a lot of companies, right? Uh, in Singapore, especially what made you pick ThoughtWorks? Like, I'm not sure if you, uh, Oh, Jesus. Like there. Yeah. It's, yeah. Why, it, why ThoughtWorks? It's, it's one of my colleagues on this still. Well, um, no, I, I've known ThoughtWorks, ThoughtWorks is, has, has done things, which I recommend you guys do. They've invested in the community. I think I've been to a whole bunch of their meetups in the past uh when they're on a moist street and things like this and um a couple of years ago i was working for gojek and there was a lot of thought workers in gojek Shit, i'm not even not, not sure if i can even say that but i said that oops and <laughs> and uh, i noticed how professional they were and the good thing about thoughtworks is that they have a lot of structure and they they give you there's a lot of good people in thoughtworks like this you know martin fowler i could I can I can just I can just chat to Martin Fowler whenever I want. You know what I mean? Um, and um, yeah, so that was a, that was def definitely a big draw for me to join ThoughtWorks. Is um, is the, the quality of the people at ThoughtWorks is pretty high. I, I is there anywhere else that's <laughs> that's got such high? Co me, me, I don't know. I haven't met any. I haven't met many people lately. Uh, I don't think Google does. Google do engineering in uh, in in Singapore. I don't. I'm not. I'm not sure. Does Facebook do it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Who do you Who do you guys think are the best engineers in town? I'm curious. Who's Who's doing the best stuff? Is it something weird? Like, is there a game studio here that's knocking it out? Uh, I'm not sure, but I guess. Uh, um stripe comes to mind oh yeah a lot yeah i guess perhaps yeah facebook. perhaps facebook yeah. facebook yeah um yeah i wish there was more to be honest i it's funny that there isn't doesn't seem to be that much i mean singapore's set up for for just you know i think singapore's a great place to to do tech stuff so there should be more and I want, and I, hopefully, I think once maybe things go back to normal, whatever that means, there'll be more, more stuff, more companies, more ideas. Because I think the startup scene has been definitely kind of like uh, shot in the head thanks to this COVID stuff, right? So yeah, um, yeah, I want to, I definitely want to see more, more cool stuff, please. Right. Huh. So speaking of cool stuff, right? I was wondering um, whether being a software engineer gets like repetitive after so long. Um, you know, you said that you've been working with the tools for, for often, right? But 
at some point, you know, it loses the freshness, right? You, you, you sort of stop discovering new stuff and you start like relying on your, you know, repertoire. So does it get boring at times or like, uh, if it a, get that, boring, how do you fix that? That's a good question. Um, well, I'm, I'm, a min I'm a minimalist. So my, I, I'm excited when I can, you know, uh, drop, drop a few dependencies and, and, uh, you know, remove lines of code and things like this. So I think software is a very, has always evolved. It's not very static for, for me. I, I'm always looking into things and there's always something, man. There's always something. It's crazy. Like for example, uh, just this week, for example, I mean, I've been using like the same Vim configuration, 20 lines of Vim for, for I don't know, 10 years, probably. Uh, occasionally I change it. You can see my dot files. But uh, it, lately I've, I've gone full retard, as I say, and I'm using NeoVim with Lua plugins. And I think it's quite exciting because, um, yeah, I really, I really like the, what, this, com I, I, the completion and things like that because I'm working a lot on Node.js projects. And I need every help I can get, honestly. I need all the lints. I need all the, the, the what do you call it? The completion stuff working, method completion and hints, uh, type hints as possible. So yeah, I'm, I, I enjoy looking at uh, playing with Neova. And I'm, I'm also, I dare say, I mean, I've been enjoying using, using VS Code. I mean, I'm going to sound super lame, I'm sure. But like, it's got some interesting ideas. I, I think, yeah, it's... That's one cool thing about engineering. It doesn't change at all, man. It just doesn't change. I mean, it doesn't get boring. That's what I'm trying to say. This is something that's going to hit you over the head. And uh, it's all, yeah, it's all change. It's all change. If you, if it's, yeah, you know how it is. You, you got to be touching the, yeah, there's so much to do. So if anyone, is anyone using NeoVim and, and Lua and, you know, NVim comp? Okay, guys, you're wasting your lives. I mean, or maybe I am. <laughs> you could just get by using vanilla Vim or just VS Code, right? Uh, yeah, you, you sound like a guy who loves working by himself. So like, are you into pair programming? What are your thoughts on that? Like, Oh, that's a good question, man. You got me. You got me. <laughs> yeah. To be honest, the pair programming is quite stressful for me <laughs> because i'm like oh no what is this what is this editor this person uses or or um i mean i don't type very fast but i think i type probably a lot faster than most people so it's a bit tedious sometimes i mean but that's a bit i think if you're working in a company if you're not if you're not like having your own startup and things like that you just got to, you got to remember that you're working with people, you're, you know, especially in a company like ThoughtWorks, it's like all about co-enablement. Co you got to be bringing people up, right? You got to be basically giving your time so that they can learn from you and, and, and things like this. So, yeah, I mean, pairing, I must say, I, it's quite, it's not easy for me at least. Um, this there have been like rare occasions where people have shown me stuff i don't know that's cool but it's <laughs> i mean i i the thing is um the thing i want to see happening into the future is something more asynchronous like like youtube like for example i do watch a couple of youtubers code like this guy named aj, AJ o'neill 86 or something like that i watch him i watch him uh, code for for minutes and hours on end um, I, and I'm happy to, and I learn things. I wish in some ways that I think the future probably hopefully will become some sort of async hybrid, you know, like you have your GoPro and you have like a highlight reel. I'm hoping, I'm hoping, um, uh, in future, my colleagues will, will basically screencast their, their, their session and maybe do like a highlight reel about where they got stuck or where they made some, uh, breakthroughs. And then I can come in there and I can do like, you know, a comment and at that point and say, Hey, you could have done the, the better this way and things like this. I think, yeah, I'm big on async uh, workflows and yeah, it doesn't really, yeah, I should have said something, but I think it's, I think it's in one of my notes, but yeah, actually it's actually number one in my, in my first draft about of top tips. 
get an async workflow. But I know it's not for everybody. Uh, people do complain when, uh, when uh, in my style too, because mo you know most people don't have good microphones and most people don't know how to screencast. If anything, if there's a tip for you guys, learn how to screencast and buy a decent microphone. It's like a hundred bucks invest, hundred bucks investment. It's a fraction of the cost of your, of your computer. I'm sure. So kind of another question, um, also about self, like how to get started. So yeah, it's from Chunyu who said they followed your blog and YouTube videos for a while. So like, what advice would you give them for someone who's trying to more, do more things in the public, but is unsure how or where to start? Whew. Well, um, I mean, hopefully you guys are all getting into open source. I don't know. Is open source flavor flavor? I don't know. Uh, everyone seems to be so happy on Mac OS nowadays and brew. I mean, guys, brew is an abomination. It is so slow. And, uh, yeah, Podman on, on Mac. Oh my God. Or Docker on Mac. Oh my God. Awful, awful, awful. I, the way you start is, 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 is use open source software, install Arch or install Void Linux. By the way, I run Void Linux Mirror in Singapore. So I use, I use Arch, I use Void, I use Mac. Just use some uh, open source software and, um, and if you use it, you'll find problems, I'm sure. And then you'll be, you'll be working in the public. You know, no, no lie, like I, I've been involved in the Debian project when I was in the university. The, th the learnings that I learned on open, I, like when I first got involved in open source, I always just thought to myself, you know, all these guys here in this open source project, so I had a bad attitude, I'd say, like, you know, many people are dismissed as losers and the way that open source development is, works is a joke and all that sort of stuff. But fast forward, I don't know how many years of commercial development open source, I would say is probably the pinnacle of <laughs> engineering, honestly, because they have the async workflow down to a T, right? Uh, well, some of the I better projects. Can, um, ask a question here, right? That I think a lot of university students in NUS, um, in CS in particular, they would say to you that um, there's a bit, there's like two issues I can see with, you know, diving into open source as a university student um, today. The first is that it sort of seems like super lonely. Um, lonely. That, you, know, that you, you know, you don't, you don't, you're talking to strangers online, right? You, yeah, it could be, community. could be creepy white guys like me. That's true. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, right. Um, and that, that's the first issue, I guess, that, you know, you want your university life to be, you know, fun, social, and this yeah. is not really a, a social thing. That's the first one. The second one is that, um, I'm not sure whether people are very clear about how, um, you know, going into open source will like help your career. That's something that people have a valid concern about, right? You know, like they have yeah. a opportunity cost, you know, I could be, you know, doing lead code for an interview or I could, you know, be working on open source. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, how would you trade off that? Yeah. Well, when I'm interviewing people, I'm, I'm obviously looking at their GitHub repo first. I mean, lead code. I don't understand how companies do that. I honestly don't. I hope ThoughtWorks doesn't do that. <laughs> I don't, I'm not even sure. <sighs> yeah, that leak code stuff doesn't, it's not even realistic. It's no remotely realistic stuff. I hope, I mean, it's a test. It, ha it has its merits and I'm sure you can jump over that hurdle and not do a stupid uh, algorithm exercise ever again in your life, but yeah, the, the reward for open source, I think is very real. Like a lot of people who got involved in, in open source stuff are probably the highest paid people I know, like seriously, highest paid people by far. I, I can share a couple of interesting stories like, um, like, uh, a guy named uh, Ian, he, he was interested in this open source thing called the uh, Mozilla. Right. And he contributed a few bugs and then he got an internship uh, in the Mozilla offices in, in San Francisco. And then he later became the editor of HTML and he, he's, he's a, I don't know, a fellow at Google or something like that. It's huge, huge things. I, I know a, few, a couple of people that, uh, you know, worked on, 
uh kde stuff you know kde is a bit lame but like you know kde the the engine of kde was called the uh, conqueror or something like that i can't remember or which later became webkit and a whole team of those guys became safari you know what i mean i'm sure those guys are making bang for buck um i haven't seen them for ages but like i had a game of starcraft 2 with with one guy a few years ago <laughs> just to keep in touch so yeah so going back to your first point how to keep it fun like what the i guess how i kept you know when i was in bath university i was i, I founded like the bath university network computer society and what did we do did we do network programming hell no we were just playing games rainbow six quake i can't even remember starcraft we're playing all these games. So I, um, it's, co it's commercial software, but um, some of the, like to run a Quake World server, uh, like I think I was really into Quake World Team Fortress. There was like a mod community. So that was kind of open sourcey. So it will come to you, it will come. Like I can't say, you, you'll, you'll just, you know, don't be a sharecropper. Do you know, do you know what a sharecropper is? um probably not a pc term anymore but a sharecropper is like i think it comes from america like the landowners would rent small parcels of land to 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 people who are just coming to america and of course if you don't own that land and you'll always be paying rent and the analogy uh i use it to say like if i don't know if you went full if you went full microsoft or full mac os you're basically you know riding on the coattails of apple and microsoft um you, you never will stand on your own two feet unless you use open source you'll you'll never have true independence unless you run something like linux and uh and things like this so so I've always sort of maybe it's my independent streak or something like that but I always thought to myself I always just had this like weird uh thoughts that like you know if Microsoft uh, became a bad actor or something like that or whatever if the if Microsoft faded away and so did Apple what 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 could I use what could I cobble together could I cobble these PC bits components and run my own software and build my own software yes I can and in fact I I did write my own uh, operating system you know with cobbled together with Linux and things like this at one point and I learned a tremendous amount and and yeah, like you will learn so much like this. And you know, like people, people who do this, I like, I, I don't really know them personally, but like acquaintances who, who like worked on operating system stuff um, that I, you know, like BSD guys, I mean, you know, where do they work? Where do the BSD guys work? They work at Apple and they, they got great careers ahead of them. And you wouldn't have guessed it if they had that sort of, you know, independent streak when they're, when they're, uh, you know, students and things like that. So, yeah, so I'm sure if you look, you'll find something fun. Hopefully you'll find something fun. Um, yeah. And, and latch on to that. Thanks for the answer for, about that, Kai. But I think there is a related question from Elvis. So like, Elvis, what a name. Okay, carry on. <laughs> Someone who's new and who's looking forward to contributing to the open source scene. Um, what what sort of work do you start with? How do you get into the groove of it? So do you go around searching for bugs, or do you? Yeah, you 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 search for bugs. You report bugs, because if you you know once you report your first bug, you'll get to know a lot about that project. Like they might call you an idiot, or they just close your bug right. But if they are a bit more nice to you, then you'll then you can go the next step, right? Um, yeah, and I my my friend who I mentioned before, yeah, um, oh, he was uh, we went to the the same university in the same year, Ian Hickson. So who later did a tremendous amount of work on you know web stuff, and now he works on Flutter. Flutter, damn you, Flutter, I hate it. Come back to the web, Ian. Um, so, yeah, when I, what I remember him doing, right, was that um, he, he had like this like measuring stick and he was measuring different parts of the rendering of the page. And he would notice like slight um, discrepancies, 
depending on which uh, you know CSS um, value you used. Or what do you call the you know EM versus uh, PX or something like that? It didn't quite conform to the specification, and he would just report bugs. I think Ian has got like a tremendous amount of bugs. Um, and, and Ian is an amazing person because I don't think um, I don't think he ever wrote a line of code in WebKit or Mozilla. I swear to God, he doesn't. He didn't touch. C he was lucky enough. He had a joyous life in the sense that he never touched C plus plus. But he just uh, wrote a, a, a truck ton of bugs. And yeah, bugs um, is the place, and issues is where you start, and it might even be where you end. You'll learn a tremendous amount of things by by uh, by managing uh, the bug tracker well. So yeah, you don't even have to code, in my opinion. Just just live on the bug tracker and and watch it and and and, and contribute to it, and um, and and you'll learn a lot from it. And hopefully, you find a a good because um, I find GitHub pretty hostile sometimes. But you know, I'm sure there's some nice project you can get, can find out there. You just have to look and don't be afraid to make a stupid bug report, man. It all starts off in a pretty low bar. Thank you. I really appreciate your meaningful stories and anecdotes. I hope all of you have gained a better understanding on how to be a better engineer. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Okay, guys. Now, have some fun. What do you guys do for fun? You, 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 do you play some huge multiplayer deathmatch or something? We contribute to open source of Funnel, man. I, 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 That's... I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, I wish. I wish. Um... Yeah. Um, does it, okay. Well, I, I kind of still game, but not really. I'm pretty, I'm pretty good at first person shooters. I still got, I still got my Razer mouse. My, I don't know. My, what is this one? The Basilisk X Hyperspeed. This thing has killed countless, countless things. So, I hope you guys have fun and uh, yeah, have and uh, please look me up on on the internet because I'm around hopefully for a few few year few years more. I still like doing what I do for some reason. It's not got boring. <laughs> okay. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks so much, Claire. Okay, bye. Thank you all for coming down for this Friday Hacks, even though it's big 12, and it might be very stressful for all of you. And this session marks the last Friday Hacks for this Sam. And please look forward to the next um, Sam's Friday Hacks and also our upcoming Hack and Roll. So all the best for your exams, guys. Yeah, thanks for the whole Sam, guys. Thanks for the support. Um, please come for Hack and Roll exam. Bye-bye. I'll end the meeting now. <laughs>